hearing from myself and then also hearing um, from Jacqueline over at Western Murray Land Group. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll start by sharing my screen and start my presentation. Okay, can you guys see that? Perfect, awesome. Um, easy, okay. Um, actually, that's not going to work because I need my notes. So there we go. Cool, okay. G'day, everyone. Um, I'm Emily Wilson, the Natural Capital Advisor for Murray LLS. Um, Today we're going to be talking about natural capital and the carbon markets. So some of you might already be pretty familiar with natural capital um, and what it is, but today I really want to take it back to the basics and talk about some of the foundational concepts um, as well as sort of why it's relevant and how it can benefit our farm business. So we'll be chatting about the opportunities that exist, um, which sort of includes the carbon market as well. So as we know, carbon's become a bit of a buzzword over the past few years. Uh, it can be pretty confusing trying to understand what the carbon market actually is uh, and how it can fit in with our farm business. So we'll be looking at how the carbon market's set up, some of the different project types that exist. Um, we'll have a look at the carbon cycle and how it, how it cycles in the la landscape and how we as land managers influence the carbon pools on our farm. And I'll also touch on whether you know, we can actually make money off carbon farming and how we'd approach um, like scoping out whether a project is relevant for us and the opportunities um, that exist. So, yeah, um, just talk through all that. So I guess before we talk about natural capital, we need to know what natural a natural asset means and what it is. So natural assets are naturally occurring resources that exist in our world. So that includes both living and non-living things. On your farm, this could be the soils and rocks. Um, it includes the water sources present on your property, such as rivers, dams and groundwater. It can include all your vegetation, so your native and non-natives, um, your trees, your pastures, your crops. And it also includes all other living things, um, such as your animals, your insects and even your soil biology and fungi. So when we talk about natural capital, we're thinking about the natural assets that occur on our farm along with the services that they provide. So these services can be called ecosystem services and they're necessary to support human life as well as our farm function. These services can include things like trees providing shade and shelter, uh, soil providing natural fertility and functional nutrient cycling. It can include our soil carbon helping with soil structure and water holding capacity. And it even includes concepts we've been talking about for years, such as ground cover protecting our soils from wind and rain erosion. So natural capital involves putting a sort of economic lens over these. It enables car companies and us a way to value our natural assets and can make it a bit easier to compare or quantify them. So this is something we've always done, but is now just getting a new name. So for example, if you were looking at buying a farm, a property that's in better condition landscape wise will generally sell for more money than the same farm in a degraded condition. So the better quality natural assets we have the better function of services we receive and the more benefits you get. So we all know that our hay is an asset, our crops are an asset and our livestock, etc. So the function of our natural assets on our farm allows us to produce these goods. So the better our system is functioning, the more we can potentially grow off of our land. Um, so I guess, like, why is there all this fuss? Why do people care about what you're doing on your farm? As we know, there's been increased concern over the last 20 years about climate change, more extreme weather events and environmental decline globally, such as habitat and species loss. So whether you personally buy into it or not, this has caused concern in the general public and in consumers. This has led to international action and treaties. So think of your things like the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreements. We don't need to know the ins and outs of all of these, but what we need to know is that it's led to government and corporates feeling pressure to take action to reduce their impacts and improve the state of nature. All this has sort of led to the fuss. So that's your policy change from governments and big international corporate companies. 
So if we think of it like the carrot and the stick analogy, these policy changes can lead to more obligations and regulations, which is the stick, but it can also create emerging opportunities, um, which is sort of what we'd rather be working in. So, yeah, we, we've discussed like government and industry policies here, and there's still more coming down the track, which is going to affect the way that we farm. We're seeing mandatory reporting of emissions as something that's just over the horizon. Industries have their own sustainability frameworks, and there are net zero goals cropping up everywhere at all level of government and um, in the private space as well. So we know MLA have their net zero by 2030, which is only six years away. So why does agriculture play a part? We contribute approximately 70%, 17% of Australia's annual emissions. So this doesn't mean it's only up to us. There are other industries like transport, energy production and manufacturing that also contribute to this, and they're already undergoing changes to reduce their emissions and impact. As farmers, we also manage 55% of land mass in Australia, and this is generally on the more productive and fertile land. So, for example, when we think about a natural park, they're generally on uncleared land that probably wasn't cleared back in the day because it wasn't as productive or it wasn't worth the effort. So operating on these more productive landscapes means that the decisions that we make on farm can have a broad effect and we can really create positive or negative impacts on our natural landscape and broader community. So I guess what we need to remember, though, is that Australian agriculture is already one of the most sustainable agricultural industries in the world, and we're really, really efficient because we have to be. Um, like you guys know that we operate in a pretty harsh landscape and we're, we're pretty limited by water, heat and our like natural sort of soil profile. Um, but we're going to be asked to do more. So already we're seeing emissions being considered up the supply chain, either because companies legally have to or because um, they're doing it to inform investors and shareholders of their impact. So that's internal policy. So this is starting to be passed down the supply chain to farmers. So for example, we're seeing JVS to start starting to ask for emissions data on the products that they're buying. Um, we're also seeing EU sustainability guidelines, meaning that you now need to collect data to be able to sell into certain markets or alternatively to receive a price premium. So right now this is mostly voluntary and it's not mandatory for everyone, but it is becoming a bit more might widespread and might start to affect your access to markets down the track. So I guess with great demand comes great opportunity. So understanding our natural capital can help set us up for what's coming and can also provide other benefits. So this can these can include benefits such as more informed decision making. Um, we can get some business diversification and the ability to de-risk. We also get landscape resilience. So as we discussed, functioning natural capital can protect us from risks as the system is more prepared to cope um, with different environmental pressures, such as drought, fire, storms, which creates that more resilient landscape. We can also get improved productivity, new market opportunities, and we can also sort of leave a bed, like a legacy for the next generation um, and improve our asset value. So what's the payoff? Like, can we make money off it? Is it going to actually affect our bottom line, like when we consider natural capital? So we sort of, there are opportunities if we're integrating um, natural capital into our, our um, sort of farming system, but not everything's going to be applicable to everyone. So some of the, I guess, benefits we can get is cost savings from improved efficiency, um, access to environmental markets, so that's the carbon or biodiversity, and I'll be touching on the carbon markets next, um, improving your asset value, market access and premiums. You have your sustainable finance, so there might be green loans coming down the track or access to finance. And also there's, I guess, new opportunities becoming viable as priorities shift and the markets shift. So I guess we're also here to talk about like what the carbon market is. So the carbon market involves putting a price on carbon through market-based mechanisms. So something to be aware of is that it's a policy-based market. So this means that government policy is the thing that's creating the market. So if that policy didn't exist, then the carbon markets and carbon credits would also cease to exist. So it involves creating a product, in this case a credit, that's sold to a buyer for a price. 
So one carbon credit is equivalent to one atmospheric tonne of carbon dioxide. So the markets can operate in either an em emissions reduction setting. So that's where we're um, lowering our emissions from compared to our business as usual. So that's um, like not emitting the carbon in the first place. And then we also have sequestration based projects. So sequestration means actively taking carbon or carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and storing it in a different form. So they're processes that our um, vegetation and soils do. The uh, major market in Australia is run by the federal government. So that's under the Clean Energy Regulator. So this is the sort of major carbon market in Australia, but it's important to note that there are also international carbon markets out there um, which operate across borders and can have different types of projects from the Australian carbon market. So they could therefore provide a suitable opportunity or more suitable opportunity than what exists in Australia, but they can also have different requirements and different ways they measure carbon um, and therefore different risks. There are also domestic markets that exist in other countries as well, like Canada and Indonesia. So they operate similar to the Australian carbon market, which is run by the federal government. So I'm going to be concentrating on Australian carbon markets. Um, so in Australia, our, our credit is um, known as an Australian Carbon Credit Unit, or ACU. So that might be a term that a few of you guys have heard before. Um, obviously, to have a market, we need buyers. So there are, I guess, three different buyers or main buyers um, in the Australian carbon market. So the Australian government buys a fair chunk of carbon credits, or at least did back in the early days. Um, there's also large corporate emitters that are legally required um, to offset emissions under like what's called the safeguard mechanism. So the government sets a cap on the carbon they can emit and anything that they emit above this, they have to legally buy Australian carbon credits to offset that. Then the third buyer is large corporates that um, are voluntarily buying carbon credits. So that for the, that's for their own purposes. So I guess I, I wanna concentrate on the current agricultural carbon methods. So a method is what the project types are based off. Um, so they're a piece of legislation and each method um, outlines the different requirements and regulations for that specific project type. Uh, so we have, as I discussed, emissions reductions projects and sequestration based projects. So a lot of the emissions reductions projects aren't really as relevant in our Murray region. So these include our savannah burning projects, which are more suited to that Northern Australia landscape. Uh, we have beef herd projects. So that is an emissions reduction um, project by getting your herd to that, I guess, killable um, weight quicker. So that's an efficiency, um, but it takes a lot of numbers to make it viable and requires a lot of data. So I think it's not really relevant to my knowledge, at least, unless you're running a large scale station with like tens of thousands of animals. So a bit above what we generally see here. So for Murray, sequestration-based projects are going to be the most applicable. So these include your soil carbon projects, as well as your vegetation projects, such as your environmental plantings and your human-induced regeneration or HIR projects. So these projects are, uh, yeah, a good opportunity, but they're also 25-year projects. So they're a big commitment to make, um, and you really want to be sure about it before you go into it. So I just want to take us back to basics a little bit and um, look at the carbon cycle and the way that carbon cycles throughout the landscape, because that's going to influence, um, like we can sort of see our influence on it and what we can do. So I guess the main thing to acknowledge is that carbon is part of a really dynamic cycle. It's constantly changing and it's constantly moving throughout the landscape. So the, there are sort of three major pools, your air um, or atmospheric carbon, so carbon dioxide, your soil carbon, and then carbon that's stored in vegetation and organisms. So I guess when we're looking at the cycle, we really want to look at the ins and outs arrows and where we can influence these to either build soil carbon in the landscape or build like our, our carbon pools, so our vegetation in the landscape. So these are generally um, biotic processes, I suppose, or processes that are influenced by um, like your plants, your animals, your microbes. Um, so with your soil carbon, 
you know, you have um, a plant taking in carbon out of the atmosphere, turning it into sugars and carbs that they put into the soil. And then you have microbes that are eating that carbon. So just like we eat food, we breathe out carbon dioxide. Microbes eat that carbon and they're breathing out um, carbon dioxide. And I guess it's thinking about um, in the soil carbon landscape, at least there's your more stable carbon. And then this is sort of shorter term carbon. So that's the carbon that the microbes are turning over quite quickly. So really when we're talking about building soil carbon, we're wanting to um, sort of influence that longer term carbon and build that up. Um, Cause that's, I guess, a bit more long-term in the landscape and, and safer. And I guess it's understand to, it's important to understand that um, the system exists in equilibrium. So when we change something in the system, it's gonna fix itself or, or find a new equilibrium point. Um, and it's also affected by the seasonality, so the weather. So with our carbon in the landscape, um, our agricultural processes can remove it over time. So we're exporting minerals um, and carbon off of our farms through fibre production and food production. And so carbon markets exist as we're trying to increase the amount of carbon in the landscape through building soil carbon or building um, carbon in that vegetation. So taking it back to basics, I guess, we're looking at the benefits of carbon in our production systems. Um, so if we're looking at trees and then soil carbon, trees, we sort of know ways that they can help us with productivity, um, especially in the livestock system. So they provide shade and, shade and shelter for animals. Um, they also help with water and nutri nutrient cycling in the landscape, and they provide biodiversity hubs as well. When we're looking at soil carbon, it helps with our production and soil health, and often practices that build soil carbon tie in with increased production. So if we're thinking of plants as being the main conduit um, to influencing, like getting carbon built up in our soil, if we can grow bigger, healthier plants, that means we're putting more soil, like more carbon into our system, um, which is obviously then going to have production benefits too. So can we actually make money off carbon? Like we, there, uh, um, carbon projects that are successful and it's a possibility, but they're not right for everyone or they might not be, um, yeah, there, there are different like things that can impact it, like a scale, your enterprise, um, how well you can integrate the carbon um, in with your production system. So yeah, it's, it's a possibility, but making money off of carbon shouldn't really be the main driver um, or the decision like that you base it off. So you really want to look at the other benefits that you get. Um, so that's your production benefits, your environmental outcomes, um, efficiency, market benefits, and you really want to balance it up um, with some of those other benefits on whether you make the decision to enter a market. So projects come with a level of risk. Um, they're attached to the land. They run for 25 years. So they could impact a future sale or transfer of the property. And there's also a level of financial risk if they're not as successful um, as you think they might be, or as if they get revoked down the track. So they require a sort of initial investment upfront or an ongoing investment. Um, and obviously you want to be getting that paid back to be able to actually make the money. So you really need to weigh up the potential success of a project on your land. But I guess always make sure you're getting independent legal and financial advice and involve your trusted advisors um, like your agricultural, like your agro agronomist, sorry. So do you need to get help from a carbon company? Um, my answer would be yes. You won't be able to do it alone. Um, it's a really heavily regulated industry and there's a lot of technical expertise and processes that are needed to run a successful carbon project. So, yeah, you need, you need a lot of people who are pretty across a lot of different aspects. So there's um, like legal legal knowledge that's necessary to go into it, including understanding the method and the requirements, um, project design, you need mapping experience, you need some ecology or vegetation, um, knowledge or expertise if you're running those vegetation-based pro projects, uh, soil science knowledge in terms of the soil projects. Um, you need to sort of have a really good understanding of management practices and how, how they can help influence um, building carbon in the landscape. And then there's a lot of paperwork and admin that comes with it as well, as well as keeping up with policy changes. 
Um, so what do these companies look like? I guess there's a few different models that might be out there. You can sort of have your fee-for-service model where you're managing the project and you're just outsourcing some of the, that expertise and um, the processes that are necessary to run the project. Or you can get someone involved a bit more um, intimately and they might be managing the project for you. So they might cover some of the costs and provide some of the services I've mentioned above, but for a portion of the credits. So you always want to be looking at the terms and conditions and be asking what's covered and what isn't, um, looking at whether there's a payback of some of the costs and also what happens if the project isn't as successful as you think it's going to be at the start. Um, carbon's really variable and it's really determined by some sources um, or variables that we can't control, like our weather, like our landscapes. Um, and there's always that chance that it might not come as well as you think it will. So it's important to know um, what might happen if that occurs. You also want to look at the types of projects that the company might run and the farming systems that they operate in. So whether they're similar systems to you um, will tell you sort of whether they're really qualified to be um, helping you run your project. And yeah, there's different ways to approaching and designing projects. So it's important to find a company that fits to you and sort of shares some of those values or is happy happy to make sure that they design a project in line with what your outcomes are for your farm. And what I also wanted to discuss is that on farm, we're already doing so much to influence and encourage um, building carbon in our landscape and tying it in with that natural capital. So we do a lot of things like looking after our soils, so promoting soil health and plant growth through fertilising, um, soil amelior ameliorants and lime, um, and using biostimulants. We do crop rotate, uh, we have grazing management where we can really influence plant growth um, and try and optimise that across our property. We have crop, crop and pasture rotations, so that can help us manage pests and pathogens, provide a broader range of soil processes and protect and enhance our soil naturally. Um, we can include le legumes, which encourages new nitrogen cycling, which then ties into our carbon cycle um, and also encourages symbiosis between uh, microbes and fungi. We can also plant, we also plant multi-species pastures. So the diversity of plants means more of a diversity of processes and root structures, um, which promotes healthy soils and supports those microbes as well. We also protect our older trees in the landscapes. We plant new vegetation and integrate it with our system. We also can protect our riparian zones and wetlands. So they're the ways that we're already doing some of these things on farm. Um, and I guess if you are already doing some of these things or you want to do some of these things, then that could tie in well with a potential carbon project if it's applicable. So I guess where to from here? What are the next steps on carbon? So really, you want to be getting informed and educated. So understanding the carbon cycle and the processes that support it um, and just knowing, like having an idea of like where the market is, where it's going, what are some of the requirements. You can talk to people who can support you in your learning. Um, so that's like your LLS, so me, <laughs> um, industry bodies, agronomists, consultants, land care, et cetera. Um, so a lot of those sort of people provide either free or paid support services um, and can really help help find some of that advice or that information for you. Also go out and talk to your carbon companies. Um, they're all different, so you really need to find one that fits in with you. And there's no obligation. Um, if they're trying to put an obligation on you to continue, then, yeah, that, that would be a bit of a red flag. And it's really about talking to them, um, talking to a few different ones and, and just working out the one that's going to be the best for you. Also working out how carbon integrates in your business. Um, so do you actually want to involve a carbon project in your business? Is it going to be worth it for you when you're looking at the potential costs and risks versus the, the benefits that you might get? And then I guess thinking about whether there are other ways that you can take ownership of your carbon story. So that can involve like, using it um, as a marketing tool, Knowing your data and knowing knowing your emissions, um, you can use it to inform management decisions. There are a whole lot of ways um, that you can sort of use it to your advantage, I suppose. Um, so yeah, that's about it for me <laughs> at the moment. Um, thank you everyone for listening. And I'll pass it back to Kathleen.
Okay. Okay. You're good. Yeah. Um, all right. Jackie, are you ready to Hello everyone. I'm just going to load up this uh this presentation. Teams is uh got its own personality as you know, so just bear with me. Um, I said we'll do some questions at the end too. So if you have anything, um, yeah, put in the chat or just write it um, down. And... There we go. Can so you see that? Yeah, can you we can see that. You can see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it a full screen? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. That's, it's really great. That was a really good presentation to get back to some of the, the fundamentals of it. And that's, that is where we need to, to start. The things that I note from that is just how much farmers are already doing. Um, and this is and this is the the next stage. This is the the crossroads really for for all farmers to understand that um, there are major opportunities and there are major challenges um, and um, barriers to market entry. And just there's a lot of work to be done. There's also a lot of um, there's there's a lot of uh, you know deep ambiguity involved in it as well when you, when you have a look at these emerging markets in in biodiversity around the world and also uh, in Australia Australia is um, supposedly leading the charge on a on a natural capital uh, the formation of a of a a, um, a nature repair market but it is I think um, we need to have a dose of reality that it's going to take quite a while and it might 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 early be pretty conservative and really only be applicable for a small amount of people as they as they work it together so um it's great to to uh, you know go on the journey to understand the fundamentals but also understand that it's um it's you know we've got a we've got a fairly long way to to go so um in the theme of this then is really about where farmers um, and our allies in in land care and in um, LLS and and other um, not for profits and farming systems groups like the one that I belong to, so Western Murray Land Improvement Group, um, is is sticking together and really having a look at a at a landscape scale and an aggregated approach um, to to market power for farmers. And by market power, I mean having farmers are you know typically price takers at every level, inputs um, and also um, who we sell to um, in the supply chain. So where do we, as these as these markets are reforming, so carbon market, the Australian carbon market's reforming, and where they're emerging, an emerging biodiversity market, where can we have a look at our buying and selling power there for, for maximum environmental and, and economic uh, benefit and, and multiple benefits? And when speaking with farmers, I'm a farmer. We've uh, my family's been farming around this uh, district for over a hundred years, and um, there are many, you know, others in 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 our area, which I'll just go to now and show you, um, that ha have um, done have been excellent land stewards over the over the years, doing all of those things that you listed, Emily, and and more but are really thinking deeply uh, about how we can have an influence on the formation of these markets that, you know, and how they're going to affect ecology, agricultural and ecological systems as they form as new systems themselves. And so um, we always go back to our map and our landscape. And just to describe it for everyone here, this is the, the, the Murray Inland Delta, which is about a million hectares. And uh, Western Murray Land Improvement Group is based in Barham in the middle of that uh, map there. And this is a really special landscape. If you can um, have a look at it, over here is um, these three uh, green areas. Are, um, uh, Ramsar form as part of them, Ramsar protected, internationally protected wetland complexes. Um, so over, um, over to the to the east is the um, Barma Millawa Forest. Um, to the north is the Wirai, and um, and over uh, further is the uh, Kundrook and Paracuta Forest. Our farm is um, neighbours with the Turumburi Weir on the New South Wales uh, side. 
but we uh, we're all related in this in this delta in in um, wanting to have the best outcomes for uh, for you know how we're going to um, form uh, groups for drought resilience, but also how we're going to um, integrate into these markets and see whether we can maximise opportunities with our natural capital here. So. What we did is we had a look at that and we reached out and were, were successful to work with uh, the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, who I used to, to work with, to see whether we could gather a group of local and national experts to come up with uh, land, land stewards co-designing their own product. What would work for us? Rather than have a market dictated um, by uh, you know legislation and 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 a to and a top down approach, what would work for us and and our landscape? So we um, came together and uh, decided that we would um, see what would what would work across a, a an inland delta. And uh, one one experiment that we ran was to uh, co-design a hydrated biolink which connected the the Wakul River to the Murray River. Um, and the Murray Valley National Park at Neurong and Campbell's Island, a state forest, with lagoons, um, wetlands at, at the heart of it. So if you'll um, see there, there's the Horseshoe Lagoon and the Sheepwash Lagoon. This is across uh, two farmers' properties, and there are other farmers around it that are interested in um, in the project as well. So these yellow, uh, this is the biolink. These would be uh, ca carbon sinks as well, so carbon plantations. Um, and this is integrated. We, we worked with the Maloon Institute as well, who are experts in landscape rehydration on how these hydrated biolinks, so improving the landscape function um, and, and retaining more water in, in the landscape is, is, is the main, um, main underpinning and thinking behind it, we made sure that um, you know we we had a really great group of ecologists and uh, Barapa Barapa representatives and uh, wetland experts and farmers. Um, so here we are um, making sure that we can make it really fun too. That we um, just in the corner is there is our friend a French chef who made sure that we were all really well fed and, and watered. Um, in this tent is right beside is on one of the farmers properties right beside the river it was a really really beautiful setting uh, and we had a lot of fun Talia was there and uh, and Kathleen was a part of the co-design group so um, we came up with a, a product concept so a conceptual plan for a hydrated biolink um, that we could you know potentially take to market it's it really it it was a, a really interesting process, um, you know, getting some of the technical details around landscape uh, uh, rehy rehydration and um, how we can get water back into our wetlands on farms, and um, it's it's still a work in progress. But here is a here is a concept that the the Murray Inland Delta farmers could really have a look at, uh, could have a look at. Part of what drove that is being is 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 also the formation and being involved in in the early design and co-design and development of a farmer-owned uh, brokerage, the the Regen Farmers Mutual, which is really looking at building the the infrastructure for farmers, the the social infrastructure and the financial and the digital infrastructure, uh, for us to be able to engage in these markets and and take a landscape scale approach. So really working with our neighbours and within our region and making sure that if there is investment, it's it's best placed um, to fit within our NRM um, knowledge and plans and strategies. Um, and yeah, we're we're maximising every 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 dollar and, and the effort that's spent to um to have the, the a, to have the best environmental outcome, so the, the Regen Farmers Mutual is uh, has uh, a digital twin for each farmer. That's part of the digital infrastructure, and that's really having a look at your um, what your carbon liabilities, your carbon footprint, and so there are calculators within it, but also really having a look at what the opportunities are um, on your farm and in your region and across the landscape. So they they're really uh, integral to what we're doing and. Um, we, uh, it's again a work in progress, but it is about sticking together. One thing that they were successful, the Regen Farmers Mutual and, and Western Murray with it, 
was was engaging with the New South Wales government to have to roll out a series of four landscape impact programs. So there were 20 REIT programs across four different landscapes, one of which was the Murray Inland Delta on, on the northern side. So there's a, a Murray Inland Delta north and, and south, which is over, over the river. It's not a a delta doesn't stop it uh, at one side of the river. So we had a really interesting um, co-designing a transaction was 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 a part of this. And so we really went through what all the different priorities of in, of environmental uh, services that farmers could could provide to engage with the market would be. And and it's really those uh, at the moment because um, there's a lot of um, you know, there there are a lot of different methods that are, have sunsetted, as they say, um, and uh, need to be the, the clean energy regulator is looking at uh, approving and forming new methods. Um, and so we're in a bit of a limbo at the moment. Uh, the the main environmental Mallee plantings method uh, finished a month ago, and we still haven't heard about uh, it's that whether the draft will be confirmed. So. Um, what we did do uh, when we uh, had our, our 20 weeks together was was have a look at where carbon um, plantations would work as uh, as a part of these biolinks. So they'd have multiple uh, biodiversity benefits, but also maximum carbon sequestration with these uh, very valuable and productive wetlands at, at the heart of them. And so it's an interesting to note about wetlands is um, while there is a, a clean energy regulated method for blue carbon, there isn't a, a confirmed one for, for teal carbon, which is um, wetland and, and riverine systems. So, um, but it doesn't mean that it's not it's not high sequestration for revegetated and revitalised wetlands. And in fact, um, the uh, Wetland Revival Trust is working with the Blue Carbon Lab and have uh, some really interesting early studies about revitalised wetlands drawing down 40% more carbon, uh, carbon dioxide, and um, and mitigating um, you know less less methane um, emissions as well. So these are important. This is important work environmentally, um, but also now that there is you know market opportunities, it's really important to keep it on top of. Just very quickly, I won't go into it, but we, this group really is is very interested in biodiversity and 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 um, not not necessarily carbon drawdown for for the sake of it. Um, we want to see multiple benefits for it. So we had a look at whether um, bio credits for for um, Australasian bitterns and and bell frogs and our hydrated uh, bio links would be would be of interest to impact investors. It's it's one one angle. It's one way to to have a look at it. Um, so that's uh, again a work in progress. But what we what we also were doing in parallel was was really trying to understand how um, some of these hard decisions we need to make in preparation um, after some very after some good seasons a run a run of good seasons in in preparing for drought. Um, and making sure that the, our natural capital opportunities are, are maximising that, our, our drought resilience, because it is, as we all know, in drought, it's it's when you make some really hard and critical decisions, um, and you don't you don't need more liability, you need more resilience. So we worked with the the drought hub um, to to have a look at uh, coming farmers designing for themselves and other farmers a decision tool. And, um, and it was a pretty interesting journey, that one as well. So we had up to an, uh, nearly 40 farmers who came to two different sessions um, to, to have a, an orientation, a really good one um, to get to the basics, as, it, as Emily has just done, but also to, to, to step ahead and, and try and be three thinking three hills ahead on, on where these markets could go, but also how it would apply in drought and before drought and, and on your own farm. So um, it's available. You can download it from the Western Murray Land Improvement Group um, Environmental Markets page. It's it's free for everyone. Again, it's it's pretty agricultural. It's made by farmers. Needs needs some work as well. But we think we've put it put quite a lot of what we have learnt along the way inside this tool now. Um, so and um, it's it's worth checking out. We're always looking for feedback on it as well. So there. Are, 
what there are sort of three main elements uh, to this as well is is helping helping or building a capacity to think about things differently so that you can you can you have a a better um, a better ability to to understand these these uh, market systems and how they apply to ecological and agricultural systems. So one thing, um, I'll just go on to this one, was really having a look at at, at your farm, not not always and instinctively, at um, because this is market driven as well. Of the productive, what has been traditionally the 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 agriculturally productive units um, of your of your farm, but looking at, at at looking at it across the board is and the land um, management units that you have. So while there is, you know, some land is is unusable, not really, and it has an unusable land has been um, is is still a natural capital asset. So if you have riparian areas um, and lagoons, um, farm dams, uh, stream order one and two, other types of native vegetation, these are all really important to have a look at. Um, as 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 also highly productive and and part of your and part of your your business um, as well. So we've we on the first page of of the uh, the workbook of the of the decision tool is really having a look at at each one of those and um, and the area that they occupy and how they integrate uh, into your into your farm business. So we've put that there and this this works with the rest of the worksheet. Um, we also had a look at um, a very, very, very simple index on um, looking at soil carbon, tree planting and biodiversity as natural capital elements, and then your pasture, forest, waterways, and, and also understanding this landscape scale project, um, the ability to have a, an aggregated transaction or a landscape scale project. So we had a look and, and um, tried to come up with a drought resilience index. So what is possible on your farm um, and, um, and and seeing whether that can add to your drought resilience. It's worth having a look and playing around with, with what we've done there. Um, but if, you, if you're able to have, you know, have actions that work towards all of those, then it can improve your, uh, your drought resilience in the end. Um, that is a part of it. Now, this next slide is pretty hectic, but I'll I'll walk through I'll walk through it. It really it 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 was um, recommended by all of the farmers in there that they just would like to have a look at where the opportunities are, whether they're emerging um, or um, whether they're actual methods, um, and also what is emerging, and be able to see whether that could integrate with the land management units they've got or their natural capital assets. Not not immediately, but also, but where in in one, two, three, ten years they they might um, address that. So this is a decision matrix that we came up with. On the left hand side are those land management uh, on the on the um, primary left hand column are those land management are your land management um, areas. So that's on one side. Across the top, and there's um, just there in. Um, in the, that salmon colour is some critical questions to ask about it to to um, to be top of mind about whether this would would work uh, for your environment and also for your for your uh, enterprise. Um, and then we get to these uh, red or pink um, across the top across the top of the matrix. These are the known and potential methods um, uh, for, um, for for market access. And I'll just go into those. Now, what that matrix really is is tick. It's ticking a box to see whether you may or may not be interested, you know, in it, and 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 getting to understand the land management units and how they cross over with with uh, potential market access. Um, the methods, and this is interesting. We, we like I said, there is um, the clean energy regulator is uh, still confirming. Some of its original and updates of some of its original methods, um, and is also has a, a panel, well, several panels uh, that are feeding into how um, how the new methods will be formed, and um, and you know which is the first cab off the rank. So it's it is worth. Um, I'm racing through this at the moment, but there's, there's um, time for questions uh, about it. If you if you have a look at uh, some of these um, market opportunities down the bottom of that that slide, there's 
you know, as um, Emily was talking about, there's business and marketing strategies and um, cost saving strategies. There's a value is asset value, and then there's sustainable finance, which is part of what the Regen Farmers Mutual is very interested in. Is making is um, is is helping farmers into um, to to de-risk um, projects by providing uh, finance that works for them. But here in environmental trading, there's tax management as well and incentive payments. But here in in environmental trading, that's that's where this methodology list comes in. How are we going to engage? The the first one here, the ones in red, and they should actually now be in pink because they are um, they're still uh, uh, have yet to be confirmed. The first one was environmental mallee planting, so putting up shelter belts as uh, and biolinks as a um, as um, to draw down carbon. So the first method was didn't work um, under two hundred hectares, and so they came up with a a pilot project, um, a pilot uh, form of the methodology where it could, you could um, accrue uh, ACUs um, under under that 200. Um, then there are, um, and then there, the other red one there is um, ERF um, uh, soil carbon projects. And there has been at the Biodiversity um, Conservation Trust or um, the biodiversity offset scheme, as it was renamed, is also um, a form of uh, trading uh, credits. The um, one, the one in pink here, is uh, nature-based solutions or, or farmer payments, and these are going to be really very interesting in the future about whether the uh, supply chains uh, or commodities will will look at giving um, farmer payments to reduce their liability in carbon pollution or um, in, in biodiversity mitigation um, uh, as well. So this is going to be a really interesting space, nature-based solutions, which comes back to us really understanding what we've got um, and, and what, our, what our assets are and what, how we can, um, we can assist in that way. The, the ERF um, integrated farm and land management method, which is bringing together soil and environmental plantings, is due is meant to be due by the end of this year. And this is something that people might you know want to follow closely. There's a lot of um, the, there can be a lot of crossover and certainly a lot of administration and there's a lot of costs into getting into projects. And if there is an integrated method that um, is is assisting farmers across the board, then it's really worth um, understanding that as well, rather than just picking uh, just picking one. Um, there is precedent around the world for a volumetric water um, benefit credit. So Microsoft has um, this forty. 40 um, examples of that. We are, as, a, as an irrigation district and also as um, uh, in a delta, we're extremely interested where, where there may be water, um, where there, you know, there, there may be extra, extra ways to get more water in our landscape as well. Um, there is, they have been working, I know the Maloon Institute and ANU and others have been working on a landscape rehydration credit. Um, there is a box gum woodlands credit that's being developed. There's a farm dam credit potentially, um, and there is animal and bird credits or certificates. Um, and then there's an integrated uh, reforestation, native forest um, and human induced method as well, which is another integration of other methods. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with opportunities. Um, and uh, at the moment, it's, there is time because they're not racing it. Well, no one's racing ahead at the moment to deeply consider the fundamentals, um, what you've got, but also what your whole landscape has. Um, so this uh, this is the time for really having a look at, at um, and stepping back, I guess, to observe together with everyone else, which we have done in our landscape impact project on the northern side of the Murray River and came up with a, a theory of change. Um, just to slow it down a bit and to, to really understand that the beginnings are that we have disconnected farms and um, disconnected natural assets on a natural floodplain with intermittent water, water uh, availability and a declining biodiversity. So we want to come together and um, assess our individual and district scale natural assets and opportunities with hydration and um, biodiversity focus so that 
we can reconnect the hydrated delta uh, landscapes and enhance our farm productivity and our wetland functionality and, and also our ability to draw down carbon. We, we see this as a massively valuable carbon sink here, but no one's going to, um, it doesn't, it, it really takes a, a big from the ground effort to prosecute that, that as a case. That this is a, a you know this is an international biodiversity hotspot and there's a reason there's a reason why it's an important carbon sink and a place for concentrating investment. Um, so we we want to stack um, these these assets together and upscale carbon and biodiversity value, um, and um, we want a thriving hydrated delta landscape and a thriving and powered functional community. Um, that's the theory of change that underlines all of that. And it took a bit to, to you know, and it's and it's early days to add to that. Um, so essentially sticking together and an aggregated uh, approach to market power is that farmers are co-designing and building the social and financial and digital infrastructure so that we can maximise our environmental and economic profit in a way that is integrated and complementary to the growing of food and fibre, that it achieves drought resilience and that it mitigates risk as, as the global economy shifts to, to counting the previous, you know, pol externalities, what were, you know, in economics it was polluting and um, wrecking biodiversity was an externality or it's external. Now they are being forced to, to account for it. But what we as farmers need to understand is that we can't take that risk on for them. We can't. We can't be taking a price to um, to draw down carbon and um, and also to uh, help biodiversity. We, we need to make sure that it's priced appropriately and that we can stick together. So that's that. Awesome. That was um really really great, Jackie. I really loved um. Yeah, the farmer-led approach, I guess an important thing to note with the carbon markets is they, they are top-down um, and regulated and, you know, that can, I guess, not always achieve the best outcomes or achieve perverse outcomes or um, leave people behind or just not be applicable to everyone. So trying to have that ground-up approach um, is just, yeah, really, really important to um, make sure we're taking into account. And, um, and, yeah, I think also just noting that, yeah, as there's – methods going everywhere with the carbon market it's really um yeah it's a really dynamic space and and you know when the governments change as well sometimes the direction can change or the policy can change or the focus can change mm -hmm. and um like we see that as well um, and i think and i think that emily that's it is that if we have mm -hmm. a grounded theory of change and we have you know established um connections in and and things that we have co-designed by thinking deeply and um about what you know what what we've got here yeah. on in, and um and in our landscapes and sticking together because it, it's just um you know it, it's pretty um it's disastrous if there is a you know mm. a policy change um that doesn't take into account yep. um you know our 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 priorities and the environment's priorities here yeah no i agree and i think um what also resonated with me was um i guess like your your point about you know, we can we can measure carbon in the methods, um, but that doesn't mean when we don't have a method or we don't have a credit, we're actually not building carbon in that landscape or, or having those really beneficial environmental outcomes. And there there is a big cost of measuring carbon um, accurately sometimes yeah. or oftentimes and and um, having to create a credit that has to have integrity and, and be conservative, conservative and, and um, like sort of have that be auditable can then come sometimes actually restrict our impact because we're focusing on one little thing instead of looking at that whole of systems um, or like, you know, other benefits that that we know are there, but, but we can't actually accurately measure it down to a level where we can then sell it. Um, so I think it's important to note that, yeah, like carbon credits and, and methodologies are great, but there's so much more um, that we do on farm that has those really positive impacts um, and looking at it with that integrated approach is really important. Um, so at 12.57, so if anyone has some burning questions or, or wants to chat, um, jump in or, or put your hand up um, or has any any points that sort of resonated with them. Um, no? 
Cool. Awesome. Um, well, yeah, I hope, I hope people found that really valuable. I think it's mostly land carers and, and farmer group representatives in the room. Um, so probably didn't end up being that landholder focus, but I think we've created a really good um, resource. I'm actually going to stop recording quickly. Um, stop. Cool. Um,